And I was there by myself for a few minutes, and I didn't know what was going to happen afterward because I calmed down right away. And uh, Bob Totten, bless his heart, beautiful man, he was a director. And he came up to me, put his hand on my shoulder, and said, Charlie, uh, I'll tell you something. He says, uh, uh, I don't care how talented the person is or isn't, you do this kind of thing, he says, you're not going to work very much in this town. Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to A Word on Westerns. Today, we are celebrating a friend, Charlie Deercop. You probably know him as one of the stars of Police Woman with Angie Dickinson and Earl Holloman. Charlie showed up a couple of weeks ago when we were taping new interviews at the Autry Museum. He sat in the audience so he could see the interviews and also see a lot of his friends who were there. It was nice for him to show up, and he also had shown up in 2017 for a wonderful interview talking about Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and his first Western, TV's Gunsmoke, where he almost got sent back to New York City. I've gone back into his 2017 interview, expanded it, added some stuff, and it's re-edited for him and for you. Charlie, thanks for joining us. Thanks for sharing your stories. Welcome to A Word on Westerns. Our guest today is somebody that you'll know from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. He played Flat Nose Curry, but he also did three Gunsmoke episodes, and I'm dying to hear about him. His name is Charlie Deercop. Come on in, Charlie. All right. How are you, pal? Nice to see you. Have a seat. Oh, goodness. Well, I'll tell you that uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid is a movie that cost $6 million back then, which was a big budget in 1969, and it ended up doing, I think, $120 million. That, uh, and it didn't get good reviews to start with. You're kidding. Paul Newman is Butch Cassidy, and the Sundance Kid is Robert Redford. Dynamite's ready, Butch. Well, that ought to do it. Then, of course, through word of mouth, and, mm -hmm. and became very big. Which was great, and it won, won four Oscars, I think, too. But uh, And the cinematography by Conrad Hall. Yeah. Ooh. How did you get cast in that role? Uh -huh. uh, my agent tells me he was on a plane reading the script, and it says, Flatnose Curry. <laughs> 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 I think I got someone in mind, he says. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I got an interview with George Roy Hill. Uh, which I wor worked with him a couple of times, actually, and uh, and got cast, you know, uh, <laughs> quite simply. Well, George is a director that uh, a lot of people don't remember today. They talk about Hawks and I know, Ford and uh, Lamette, uh, but but George Roy Hill, not only did he do that, the next year he did The Sting that you're in as well. Yep. What was his style of directing? I really appreciate it because he obviously had everything you know, in his head as to what he was ultimately going to do, like storyboard it. But when we were on the set, I mean, he was just joking around all the time, and you would never know that he was, like, you know, really inter interested to whatever degree. But he was, uh, he was very easy to work with. I don't remember him giving me any direction, except the one scene on the train where I'm behind Newman, and I get out Fox by him, and I think that I've stacked the deck for Newman, and then I just just slowly disappear, like like a balloon emptying. And he said to me afterward, he says, that was either the worst reaction I've ever seen <laughs> or the best. And he says, I thought it was great. So he never told me to do that. But what I liked was Bert, the best directors I've ever worked with, and Sidney Lamette was one of them, usually said the least to me, mm -hmm. allowed me to do whatever I do, and if they wanted some correction, they would. But the other ones, the more insecure ones, would be, you know, giving you all kinds of end result directions mm -hmm. and uh, things that uh, you really can't play as an actor. Well, in, in that film, I recall, uh, you know, that's that's what made Redford a star. The charisma, the camaraderie, the buddy movie, that was really one of the first buddy movies with uh, Newman and Redford together. Yep, that was uh, that was what uh, was most important, and it was the relationship between the two of them. An incredible pair of rugged adventurers, creating a living legend on two continents. But it's just one guy. Don't you get sick of being right all the time? 
we had a, a mutual friend who just a special actor talking about right. good actors. Uh, Tim Scott oh, surely my goodness. was. What a beautiful human being he was. Did you first oh. meet him uh, oh, on gosh. Butch or did you know him before? Oh, no. We met in Durango, Colorado in Butch Cassidy. And uh, we, uh, we got along really well right off the bat. I mean, like you said, we had a great sense of humor, mm. very dry and wonderful. And then wouldn't you know, Next year, the very next year, I get cast in another Western, and Tim Scott's in it too. And not only that, it's in Durango again. <laughs> so when we got to the hotel, I hired him where we were staying. They had a big marquee. Welcome back, Charlie Dirk. I'm Tim Scott. <laughs> but Tim was a beauty. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some girl, uh, it's the second time we were there. We went to this place, the Diamond Bell. It had melodramas in there, and the lady was a waitress. Just fell in love with Tim. And uh, so she actually even promoted a Western film festival just to have Tim come back. <laughs> so we did. We, and that lasted about five years in a row, yeah. you know? Because Tim was very simple, and he was not aggressive that way. But she would wanted his attention and so forth. And, and she would call me up on the phone at nighttime. How, how come Tim, how come what? It's just, and then we would talk forever. He was a fine actor, and he also did theater work. He and Jimmy Gammon started the Met Theater together I know, I and, know. and worked there. That's where his uh, memorial was. Yep. I was there. I was there, too. Yeah, well, well something, huh? Yeah, he was something. Uh, and and yeah. he was P.I., P.I. and Lonesome Dove, Tim Scott, who we're talking about. Yeah. Just a wonderful actor. Well, well, if you wanted a cowboy like Tim, I think he's from New Mexico, too. Mm -hmm. and I so. Think so. Like, but he was just that tall, slender, I mean, easy going, and showed in his work to a point where you didn't think he started talking. And as uh, doing his dialogue, I thought, well, gee, I don't think he's that good of an actor. And I realized he's better than I think, <laughs> you know, because it was really simple, and he related to mm -hmm. people, and he was open and available. So, but Tim, I loved him and loved him, and everybody who knew him loved him because he was just that special a, a, a guy. You know, in my hometown, I got out of the Marines in 1955, September. That's when Gunsmoke started. Kids, uh, this is Marshal Matt Dillon of Gunsmoke talking to you. Now get to bed early and get some rest because you don't want to miss my new CBS television show. And uh, Good night. Now that we got the kids in bed, it's safe to tell the adults. The show starts this Saturday night on CBS at 10 o'clock Eastern time, right? That's, That's right. That's Gunsmoke. So thank you very much, Marshal. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I came from New York, and there was always a little, a little competition between New York and Hollywood. New York actors thought that they were like the cream de creme, and, and Hollywood was all superficial. So that was that uh, competition going on. But anyway, we had this one scene where I'm coming out, uh, we're breaking out of the, the jail. And uh, when I first started studying acting, you, you learned that you would relate to whatever took place. If you dropped a, a cup, you wouldn't pretend it wasn't there and pick it up. <laughs> You'd bend down and pick it up. <clears throat> well, as we were getting out of the jail, the door, I was supposed to close the door because I was last. And I, the door didn't close. So, and I jumped back a little bit. And I'm out of shot now. I'm out of frame. You know, I'm supposed to pretend like it didn't happen. But... Uh, Anyway, I saw the crew, and I thought my insecurities were immense, especially at that time. And I thought the crew was chuckling at me for being stupid or something. So I got peed off. I took off my kawaii, and I threw it up in the air, and I stormed off the set. And I was there by myself for a few minutes, and I didn't know what was going to happen afterward because I had calmed down right away. And uh, Bob Totten, bless his heart, beautiful man, he was a director. And he came up to me, put his hand on my shoulder, and said, Charlie, uh, I'll tell you something. He says, uh, I, I don't care how talented the person is or isn't. You do this kind of thing. He says, you're not going to work very much in this town. And I said, well, thank you. And then we went back to the set and continued on. And he hired me again for another gun smoke. So... That's the kind of people. Well, he had, he had been an actor. He what a wonderful director he oh, was. Yeah, yeah. He understood where to put the camera, which made his westerns work. Later, of course, he did uh, the Sackets, which right. uh, was was wonderful. But he did a lot of gun smokes. He did two of yours, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, he called me back on the set. You know, so that's the kind of people. Like I said, that gun smoke was a part. It was family. It really was family. When you, they, everybody was very very kind and very open with you. No agendas, nobody. And, and usually the star of the show sets the agenda. If the star of the show is uptight and tense, then everybody becomes uptight and tense because it 
trickle, trickle down. <laughs> that's where trickle down works. So Jim Marnes set the tone. He, he's relaxed. He's easygoing. So consequently, it set the tone for everyone else. And, uh, and it made a very wonderful experience. And uh, So every time you came back, it was the same warm feeling? Oh, absolutely. No, no, I mean, it was just absolutely wonderful. You didn't even know, you, like Arnaz, you never even know he was acting. He was like so real and just simple and... And, uh, and it was just uh, a wonderful experience. The really important thing about Gunsmoke was the characters, not so much the script, which was fine and good, but it was the characters, the authenticity of each character. I mean, they, like I said before, they were great actors. Not good, but great. I mean, Dennis Waver and Ken Curtis and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, authentic really described uh, what uh, I feel about Gunsmoke. As a matter of fact, and this is no baloney, I watched, I got the uh, Western Channel, and I swear, I, I've seen every single gun smoke at least three times. <laughs> every time it's on, I watch it, except that it, now it's on, a, there's channels that have commercials. That bugs the heck out well, of me. Well, you got to do what I do is you record them, and then you watch them later because they've, they've got about 18 minutes worth of commercials. I know, yeah, I just... Uh, and you just got to whiz through it them. It just drives you nuts. Yeah. Uh, so, but I liked on the Western Channel, there's no commercials. Mm -hmm. So every day I would watch Gunsmoke. Yeah. Every day, just about. And I never got sick of it. I don't care if I've seen it. The, how many times I've seen the episode? I would forget anyway that I'd seen it. But uh, Well, it's so great because there's over over 600 episodes. You've got the half hours, and that's in one package on a, on some channels. Then you've got the hour-long black and whites. Those are like movies with directors like Mark Rydell showing yep. their stuff, and yep. composers Bernard Herrmann and Victor Young and Franz Waxman. These guys all were composing original scores. So they were like mini movies. And then, of course, the colorist episodes when John Mantley took over and uh, brought in uh, Jim Burns and they 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 did wonderful character stories still it was always oh absolutely no the stories are great I don't mean to minimize that for sure I was just saying that the characters is what keeps you interested in any series really it's the characters I feel uh, and the relationship with the characters that really are Get you, you did a wonderful episode with Bo Bridges, yep. uh, where he's the guitar player and, and uh, you're a bad guy. Yep. And, uh, Steve, I not me. But we were like jolly bad men. We didn't like, we don't mean. <laughs> there was a wonderful older gentleman that was in the show, and uh, we, we, we wrapped early one afternoon, and he invited me over to his house, and his wife was there, and we had lunch, and he was talking to me, and he says, You know, Charlie, you probably know who that is by that. But he says, you know, Charlie, he says, I, I can spot talent. You're going to do good in this business. I did the same thing with Bronson. And he looked what he did. Anyway, that was Dub Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to mention that story because Dub was very beloved. And as a matter of fact, remember, he used to do his early westerns. He'd play the same exact character, the same name. Yeah, Cannonball. Cannonball, yes, Cannonball. I grew up with my aunt and uncle and... Uh, they watched only a couple of shows, and he just brought the television the first time. But Gunsmoke was the one. Oh, that was it, Gunsmoke. And oh, they had to wait for Gunsmoke every week. So meanwhile, I had no idea I was going to become an actor. I ended up so forth and so on, and I become an actor. And when I did a Gunsmoke, holy macro, they just went nuts. <laughs> I was a hero then. Of course, not to my face, they wouldn't tell me. <laughs> well, why did you decide to become an actor? I lived with my aunt and uncle, so after I got out of the Marines, I went to uh, visit my mother in Jersey City. Now, I hung out with a few guys. We thought we were gang guys, you know. We thought we were tough. And meanwhile, I was in this restaurant, and, I, and, uh, and a guy comes in and says, he's a hypnotist. So the guy says, oh, turn me into a milkshake. Oh, do this, do that. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, hey, this would be interesting. I said, I, I like it. So he gives me all these post-hypnotic suggestions. And uh, when, he touch, when he touches a tie, I'll say fresh fish. When I go to sit, it'll be too hot. And when I drink water, it'll be like whiskey or scotch, whatever. And so, uh, as the, uh, and as he does, as he's talking, I say fresh fish as he's talking. But meanwhile, knowing him, I'm not going to go fresh fish. And these guys will say, oh, I push it. So uh, I, I, I continued on. But it's hot. My goodness, it's hot here. And my instincts just took over. And at the end of it, this friend of mine said, Man, that was terrific. That's all I knew what I was doing. He said, oh, you should become an actor. And across the river is uh, New York City. Honest to goodness, that's the very first thought that I ever thought about becoming an actor. I thought, well, maybe this is something I can do because it was like each week I was going to do something different. you know. But I, what I wanted to do is 
become I played pro ball, baseball. I was a pretty good baseball player. But uh, so that's how that started. You know? And I went to acting school on the GI Bill. So the Marines paid off. All right. You know? <laughs> well, let's hear it. My name is Rob Word, and we love bringing these programs to you. We've got a lot more scheduled coming up. We post a new one every single week, and we want you to subscribe, like, and share. Thanks for watching.